Right, so let me share screen and then we shall start. Good morning to everybody. Okay, so um, this is session four of six on Bible-based sharing. And today, let's start with when you get connected, you talk as usual with your friend or friends. Okay, and God's intention for mankind from Adam, the first person on earth, has always been to listen to God, to trust God and obey Him. But Adam allowed Eve to not obey God and try listening to a different good opinion. You know, the serpent came to talk to Eve and Adam did not stop Eve from eating the fruit. So he allowed, God, uh, he allowed Eve to listen to this good opinion from the serpent. And we know the result, they had to leave Eden, which represented paradise. So from then onwards, we will keep seeing the same thing, that God made us to be good, just like Adam and Eve and the world that he made for us. But we people have our own ideas and standards of good, which are different from God and actually not suitable for eternity. And we can see evidence of that when we look around in the world. And surely we don't want eternity with all the problems in our world, right? Okay, so you can see how throughout human history, all these, all the years from time of Adam and Eve now, people do what seems good and right in their own eyes. For those of you who know the book of Judges, that's exactly what God's people were doing. Doing what seems good and right in their own eyes. And mankind shows that he is capable of goodness and greatness. He's capable of goodness and greatness, but not enough. Okay? Despite man's goodness and greatness, is still not enough to make our world free of evil, suffering, and pain. Now, our world will continue to face greater crisis with each new generation. And we are already facing a lot of uh, climate change. Now, a lot of new generation people and, uh, and people are talking about climate change. And world is facing greater stress, greater more and more fears, family violence, uh, just on the news, just this, this past week, just on the news, family violence and uh, couple violence, violence to children, violence to the people who are helpless in the sense that they are, um, you, you know, they are the people who are either they're paralyzed or they are handicapped, staying at home. Uh, the statistics, I just heard two or three statistics. France, the the family violence has risen as high as 30% increased over this time of pandemic when people stay at home. So France, 30% increase. Um, Singapore, about 20, 25%. And Great Britain, 25%. So you can see that family violence is on the increase um, when people are staying home more during this pandemic. And then we see rising divorce rates, suicide rates. We see a lot of crime, more and more crime. We see more and more sicknesses. Uh, now we have COVID-19 added to the list of many kinds of flus and other sicknesses mankind faces. Right, so our world is facing greater crisis with each generation. And these earth problems are enemies of human well-being. You know, these problems, they do not give us a sense of well-being. When we experience the attacks and oppression of these, what I call enemies huh, in inverted commas, and we think clearly, we realize that no matter how good our goodness is, huh, it is still not good enough for ourselves, for our world, and the problems that we face. Some people say earth is dying. And the human world, is not doing any better. In fact, both earth and the human world are in bondage to decay. 
We saw that in Romans 8.21. So when you think in terms of bondage to decay, we are, really it's true. Look at how Earth, through climate change and other problems, uh, forest fires and so on, that's planet Earth. Then the human world, you have all the stress, the fears, the family violence, the divorce, the suicide, the crime, the weakness, sicknesses and all that. So we are all in bondage to decay. With our world worsening, God offers his alternative. Be holy or different from our natural inclinations. Follow his ways. Fight the spiritual warfare that will make us his holy people for a heavenly kingdom of eternity. So you can see God offers us a solution from this world that we, we in that sense, have kind of done very badly with. So you can talk about your understanding of being holy in God's way. What would you need to change for you to be holy? That means different, like God wants you to be. Okay, what would you need to change for yourself, right? Don't talk about changing people. Change yourself. Now, bear in mind, we explored the idea of holiness is not sinless, not perfection, but becoming increasingly different from your, your and my natural human tendencies and behaviours. Okay, so you start with talk and then you go to share the word. So God's word, the Bible, makes us aware of our need for spiritual warfare to be holy. Right? Uh, holy means be different. This is the solution for mankind. It's for eternity. It's as God's holy people, and it will be in his heavenly kingdom. Now, we are here on planet Earth to work that out for ourselves. Okay, so COVID is a time to keep God's um, chance and work on it to, because God is telling us that we are mortal, our lives are fragile. So a time of crisis re really reminds us time is short. And we know that without holiness, no one will see God. So we need to work on that. So here's what we discover for session four to add to the earlier sessions. Now, personal holiness is important for each person and also as a people of God. Holiness is for each person, but it's also for all. We say, for example, in a military war, no single soldier fights alone. To be effective, soldiers fight in a formation or in tandem with his own army. It's the same thing with spiritual warfare. Each of us needs to train and to be equipped to fight for ourselves and also together as a formation of God's people. We engage in holy spiritual warfare in the Christian life as an assembly of God's people called the church. So church comes from a Greek word which means assembly, a gathering. Okay, so when we have that, it's like a chain where the local church is only as strong as its weakest link. That's to say that when we are a gathering of God's people, how strong we are is only as strong as the weakest chain, uh, weakest link or the weakest member. Okay, because that's where we will encounter problems and attacks. Now, this means that each individual Christian's preparation and training must enable them to be a strong link. So each person, especially considering, may be considered the weakest. We all have to constantly be raising their level of spiritual warfare capability in that sense. Okay, so must enable them to be a strong link in their local church assembly. Every individual trains in partnership we, we receive the training alone, but we also need to train in partnership. Okay, we have to fight. In the training, we have to fight in the training to 
as, as an individual, but we also need to train in partnership with each other and all need to get the act together. Okay, so we don't fight independently ourselves, but we need to fight as a unit. So in spiritual warfare, each of God's people has to train and fight against the tendencies of their human nature and what they naturally think, human nature, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we do things, and the way we say things as people. These are tendencies we, we have, which we have in spiritual warfare, we have to fight against, okay? To be holy or different like God. So let's take a look at 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 9. It's uh, quite a long, long paragraph. Uh, maybe we can unmute and all read this together. Shall we unmute and read it together? Yes. Okay, on the count of three, we read together. One, two, three. First, first Peter, Peter 1, one, one three, three to nine. nine. Verse nine. Praise and you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. All right, thank you. This is quite a long paragraph, okay, talking about the new birth and the living hope that God gives us and is accomplished through Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And this new birth, new living hope is to give us an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, and that is kept in heaven for us. Okay? So inheritance is possible because someone died, that is Jesus died. So God gives us an inheritance through, through Jesus' death, that is in heaven, that will never perish, spoil, or fade. That's very different from the world. Just now we said the world is in bondage to decay, right? Romans 8.21. And it's all possible through faith, okay? And faith shields us by God's power until the salvation that is ready to be revealed comes. So there is a salvation when we receive Christ, and then there is the salvation, another point when Christ comes for his people. So in this whole plan of God, we greatly rejoice. But in the meanwhile, what the Bible says, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Okay? Mm -hmm. Suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And the trials and the grief come so that your faith, which is, of greater value than gold, and gold perishes even though refined by fire. Your faith, being refined, may be proved genuine. 
and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ comes. So the praise, glory, and honor, the greatest portion of it goes to Christ. But for those who have been faithful, we also receive praise, glory, and honor from Christ himself. Okay? So our spiritual warfare, what we go through, will be rewarded. And though we have not seen him, we can still love him, and we can believe in him, and we can be filled with a joy that is inexpressible and glorious. The reason is by that time we will receive the full salvation of our souls, which is the goal of our faith. Okay, so like any study or training we undergo to be proficient in our studies or our work, etc., the process of spiritual warfare training to be holy is hard work. Okay, it will test and prove the genuineness of our commitment, our faith. Okay, so you can see that it talks about grief and all kinds of trials. So that is hard work that to go through and that is definitely a testing for us. So we must not think that, wow, as Christians, God solved every problem. I don't need to suffer. There's no pain. There's no struggle. Not true, huh? okay? Because the grief and the trials will come. It may, may come from different places, from different people. All right, but it will test the genuineness of our commitment and our faith. So this is where it's important, once again, the lesson, don't backslide. No matter what happens, no matter what experiences you have, even with Christians, okay? Perhaps they are faithful, struggling as well. Perhaps they are not. You don't know. You and I don't know. We don't know how faithful they are uh, in their struggles, but we must not backslide. Now, so it involves grief and hardship, and these will cause our human nature to struggle, and resist, and avoid spiritual warfare. Okay? Grief and hardship, just now the Bible says trials. Okay? You have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So when we experience grief and hardship and trials, it's very natural, our human nature will struggle, it will resist, and it will not want to engage in spiritual war and face and say, oh, I will be different like God. I will try to be different like God is different. Okay? Our human nature will resist that. So this is where we must remember, God never said Christian life and holiness training are easy. Okay, the Bible makes it very clear that life is not easy, even as a Christian. So do not, do not fall into the trap of people who tell you, oh, Christian life very good, and it's all goodness and all blessing, no suffering, no pain, no struggle, nothing. That is not, that's not the Bible that we have. But our genuine faith will be refined. Okay? So this is where God does something good out of the struggles that we have to go through. That is, we find our genuine faith when we encounter and overcome trials and faith challenges. And this is a process that will fill us with joy, especially when it dawns on us that we are receiving the goal of our faith, which is God's eternal salvation with result of praise, glory, and honor Jesus will share with us when he comes. Okay, so First Peter Chapter 1, verses 3 to 9 gives us assurance that we can expect to be, in a sense, tested. So we train on the job in spiritual warfare at the same time we are on God's mission. See, we are tested because the testing shows that our training is effective. Right? Our training is effective. It is working when we can so-called win in the sense, huh? over our human nature. So this is a training, on-job training. At the same time, we are on God's mission. Okay, so it goes side by side. It's not that I finish training already, then I go on God's mission. 
So that's where sometimes when, when people are approached to be involved to help or to get, uh, go into ministry of some kind, they say, oh, no, 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 I'm not ready. I don't know how to. This is exactly the point. It's on the job. Okay? So there is the learning, there's the training, uh, and on the job, there's also the engagement in God's mission. So Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Okay, can we have one person to read this for us now? Just one person this time. Okay, go. Cool. Then Jesus came to them, his disciple, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you, Jasmine. So we see that Jesus sent his disciples out for mission and God actually has a double mission for disciples and that is to work with two basic groups of people. Okay? Two basic groups of people. Um, see, the first group is those who have not accepted Jesus and God's purpose for all of us. They have not accepted yet for whatever reason, okay? And these people could include those who do not commit to live up God's holy calling, all right? Um, and basically, the bottom line is knowingly or unknowingly, they reject God and His own and His good eternal destiny for them and for all other people. So this is the first group of people when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Before we can make disciples, we have to bring them in, uh, share with them the message of salvation and bring them into the kingdom of God and then make disciples. So the second group will be those who receive Jesus and become his disciples. And the focus here is make disciples of all nations, blah, 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 all the way out to the end to see that the focus is actually about making disciples. All nations will tell us is all people. You see, it's not just uh, our own country people or some countries, but it's all people groups, right? The original language embraces the idea of all people groups. So God's first mission, as we can see or understand, is actually evangelism. Okay, that's, we said there's a double, double mission. The first mission is evangelism. And evangelism is to reach out and lead people to accept Jesus and God's purpose. And these new followers of Jesus are to be taught to be, are to be taught to be his disciples. Okay, so what is evangelism? I've got the asterisk here. It simply means sharing the message of salvation Jesus offers so that people can come into the plan and journey of God's eternal life and destiny. Now, the second mission is discipleship. So maybe I can, uh, I can highlight this a little bit. Evangelism. And the second one is discipleship. Each generation of Jesus' disciples learns and then trains in God's spiritual warfare, and in turn, they will teach and train their next successive generation in spiritual warfare. So with every generation of disciples, this happening, every generation needs to obey and be faithful to God, trusting Him as they do His work for them, okay, and towards the final salvation of eternity. Okay, trust him as they do his work for them. So God's work is in the people who are disciples as they work towards the final salvation of eternity. And at the same time, God's work is also through them to evangelize. Okay? 
So we see that faithful disciples reach out to fellow men to do God's work before Jesus returned. Can one more person read Luke 10 verse 2, please? Luke 10, 2. Luke 10, 2. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Thank you. All right, so Jesus told his disciples that it's a plentiful harvest. And this harvest refers to the many people to be reached out to bring to God. But those who are doing this are few in comparison to the need. So we see that God wants or God needs. Okay, now I use these two words for a very specific reason. One is God wants. The other one is God needs. We'll talk about that a little bit later, why there's these two words. He, so God wants and needs workers to share his good news of salvation, right? That was the, um, the Great Commission here just now that Jesus told his disciples. God wants to involve his people. And so Jesus sent his disciples to reach out and link up with the rest of the world to bring them into God's master plan for all of us. So if we start as early in life as we can, our lives will be filled with this great meaning and purpose to bring people to salvation. And then we teach and train them in the spiritual warfare to walk with God and to obey God. Now, here's the thing. If we wait till we are old and retired, we may have less time or we may lack the health for this important mission. Or see, it's the start this important mission is the start of people going to have a relationship with God, walking with God. Okay? So the more people who start this mission from young, the more people can be saved for eternity because there are many years uh, that we can do this thing. If we wait till we retire and so-called have more time, this will mean the lost opportunities of the people we could have reached for God and for their own eternal destiny in the years we wait to have more time. It's the same thing for discipleship. If we say, ah, yeah, I'm busy with life, I have no time for discipleship. Same thing applies. So whatever applies for evangelism also applies for discipleship if we have no time. Okay? Uh, a lot of people are going to miss out um, in something very significant. It may be a hard truth to swallow, but truth does often sting us when it opens our eyes to the consequences we fail to realize. Of the many people we could have reached out to earlier, a number could have gone to a lost eternity. Okay? In a sense, if we live for ourselves without any concern for the salvation of others and their discipleship, this bears spiritual consequences we are not thinking about or we are not realizing how we are affecting others spiritually. Remember, we have been talking again and again how global warming is one way people's actions could have consequences on other people. Yeah? And the consequences now become global, not just certain individuals. And this is a spiritual aspect that we're talking about when we have no concern for salvation and discipleship of people growing in Christ. This is the spiritual aspect of how people's actions or non-actions could impact others. Okay, because then a lot of Christians are fumbling on their own and struggling. And like I said, remember just now, the weakest link. So we may have actually a lot of very weak links in the body of Christ or the church if we don't do the um, evangelism and the discipleship in tandem strongly. So someone may say, okay, just preempting, in case somebody says, why put us or why put me on a guilt trip that is my fault, it's our fault, that people perish because I don't or we don't spend our lives evangelizing them or discipling them. Why put us on a guilt trip? Okay. That's a fair enough question. Does it look like a guilt trip? 
it's not a guilt trip because first of all, it addresses man's issue that a loving and powerful God does not stop, does not prevent evil, suffering and pain. Okay, so here it is actually, this is one of the ironies of life. Each of us has played a part to cause suffering and pain in our relationships. How many of us have never had a quarrel, have never had a bad thought in our life towards other people, right? Some of us are in a position to do greater damage that causes global scale consequences, like world leaders, governments, bosses of big co corporations, etc. Right? Now we see that the young people rise up and the Swedish teenager and other people, movements, youth movements, and other people who are not young are rising up to talk about, do something about climate change, global warming, and they target the message on world leaders, governments, bosses of big corporations, because these are the people with the most, in that sense, influence of power and the means to do something about it. Yeah. So if they don't do, then they're in a position to let the damage get worse. So that's where you say some are in the position to do greater damage. Because we already cannot, in that sense, reverse everything. But by adding on to what's already there or by not doing anything, we're actually letting the damage continue. So God's double mission is for his disciples to lead all people, all nations. That's what Jesus said, all nations. To salvation, then teach and train them to be holy or different through holy spiritual warfare. The significant, out, significant outcome is where they learn to resist the human nature tendency that causes suffering and pain that puts this world in bondage to decay. When we evangelize people and train them in God's holiness, it should lead to people understanding and making the choice to stop or prevent evil, suffering and pain. Okay, so evangelism and discipleship should actually come to the point when they learn to be disciples of Jesus, they understand the need to stop or do something about evil, suffering and pain. In other words, evangelism and discipleship are God's avenue for us, okay, for us to be partners with him to stop, prevent, reduce evil, suffering and pain on earth. So it's not a guilt trip, okay? It's not a guilt trip because it is an avenue for us to do something about this thing that's happening in this world of evil, suffering and pain. It gives us a chance to be involved with God as partners because we ourselves have added to the suffering and pain Okay, and on a bigger scale, people have uh, been in positions to do something that can be on a bigger scale than just one to one personally. So you can see it's actually a way to be involved with addressing evil, suffering, and pain, being involved with God. So it puts us in a position to show that we care about suffering and pain in this world. If we fail to be involved in this double mission, we reveal that we really don't care. Or do we expect God and other people to care and then they must prevent and mend the consequences while we go on our own way to continue doing as we please? So you see, the idea of Evangelism and discipleship is actually to get us on the way to do what is good for mankind. Okay, so it's not a guilt trip, it's doing something good for everybody and ourselves. So if Jesus' disciples were to continue to live as they please, without reaching out to the unsaved and training them to obey Jesus' commands and be holy, that's different, mankind will have no hope for this life or the afterlife. Don't forget, Jesus' disciples are the people who have the message of salvation for this life and for eternity. So without 
doing, carrying out these two faithfully, then the rest of mankind will have no hope. Like I said just now in earlier introduction, mankind is capable of greatness and goodness, but not enough for our world. Okay, so it all comes back to us. We, can, we are capable of doing a lot of things, but we are still not able to stop all the wrong things in our world. Another thing about the, it's not a guilt trip. Second point, this is part of spiritual warfare to teach, test, and train Jesus' disciples to grow in God's love. In a world where many people want to do as they please, Jesus' disciples must show that they are different, they are holy, and must love others and care about their eternal destiny. As Jesus commanded, the disciples will be teaching other people to love and care for others. Okay, so you can see it's a ripple effect that when we bring people in through evangelism and when we disciple them, okay, it's a way of teaching them to love and care about themselves because it's their eternal destiny, but also love and care for other people. Okay, so it extends um, something, teaches us to be not so selfish like our human nature, which is selfish. And this is where I come back to that point where you remember I said God wants, God needs. So God wants because he wants us to be involved. God needs because this is the way that human beings will learn to grow to love, will learn to grow to care. Just like uh, we, we use the, the example or the analogy that when you lead a person to Christ, it's like spiritual new birth. You have a spiritual baby, right? And a spiritual baby is just like a normal human baby in the sense that you, it's, it's very young and you need to love and take good care of it. You need to feed the baby. So God needs workers to be like spiritual parents, okay, to bring people to be born again into God's family, yeah, and then they need to take care of the baby, feed the baby, clean the baby, and train the baby up. So the needs there is actually for us to do this thing of growing each other, taking care of each other, and growing that love character that is holy about God. So this is where the needs come in because it's where we are growing and being formed into that character of love that God wants. Okay, so what seems like a hard truth to swallow when we realize the implications, the, the implications on the negative side versus the, the implications on the positive side you see, it's not, it's not a guilt trip. It's actually helping us to realize what is the important thing we can be doing, even though we are one. But when one combined, remember, the, the training of spiritual warfare is not just one person, but it's the whole body of Christ. The power of one multiplied by the body of Christ that works and the effect will be very dynamic. Okay? So next point, as faithful disciples train in holy spiritual warfare, they may, in the process, renew their life purpose. It's not automatic, okay? It's not automatic. It's just like when you grow, uh, when you, as a baby, when you grow older, you don't automatically become wiser. You don't automatically become better. Okay, you just grow older, full stop. So the wiser, the better part actually comes with a lot of teaching, a lot of training, and a lot of um, deliberate choice. Okay, our choice is always important in every part of life. Choice. Choice to receive Christ or not receive Christ. Choice to be involved in discipleship or not to be involved in discipleship. So same, as we train in holy spiritual warfare, we may renew our life purpose, but it's not 
automatic. It's a choice. It's an awareness. Okay? To be of one mind with God through doing the work that Jesus entrusts to them, the faithful disciples. Okay, so one mind, a change of mind, purpose, life purpose and the mind. Can somebody read for us 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21? Second Corinthians. Go ahead. Second Corinthians five sixteen to twenty one. So from now on, we regard no one from a world of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be a sin offering for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you. Okay, so to be of one mind with God, there is that change of the view. Okay, and so um, this worldly view, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Because even though we look at Christ from a worldly point of view in the past, we, as disciples training in warfare, we will not look at Christ from a worldly point of view. And so this is where change takes place and we become a new creation. Okay? So if anyone is in Christ, the idea of in Christ is that relationship that we stay within, with Jesus Christ. So as long as we stay in that relationship with Christ, we regard Christ not in a worldly way, and so we become a new creation. We are all, all the thinking and all the human nature ways will be gone if we continue to stay in Christ with the right thinking, with the right attitude and the spiritual warfare against our human nature. And so the new person has come. Okay? And this is possible through God doing the reconciling work through Jesus. And then Jesus gave us the same mission to reconcile people. Okay? Now, it's possible because God made Jesus who had no sin to be a sin offering for us. Okay, our... Uh, NIV Bible says no sin to be sin for us, but I put a sin offering for us because it's given in the footnote. Okay, NIV Bible gives a footnote that Jesus who had no sin was a sin offering for us. Okay, another person read for us please Ephesians 2, 14 to 18. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you, who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Thank you. I took this out of the context of the passage, uh, but let me just put it in 
uh, to explain the picture a bit. Nah? Jesus himself is our peace, who has made the two one. Now, in the Bible, the two refers to the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay? The Jews are the people of God, and the Gentiles are people who are not God's people. So that's where, the, in, in a sense, there are only two groups of people in the world, those who are God's people and those who are not God's people. So Jesus himself is our peace, the peace child who brought the two groups together to make them one, and the barrier that's in between, okay? The barrier that's in between God's people and the non-God's people, the Jews and the Gentiles. This barrier that separated them and caused them to be hostile towards each other. This barrier was destroyed by Jesus, bringing peace. So the idea of peace is to reconcile them, okay? By abolishing in his flesh, that means as a, hum as a, as a human being, like everybody else, Okay, Jesus was able to destroy this or, or get rid of the wall of hostility, any barrier. And he's, he does it not as an accident, but with intention. His purpose was to create himself one new man out of the two. So the two will become one people of God. It's possible now. One people of God. Not about Jew and Gentile anymore, but everybody can become one, God, one of God's people. Okay? And this will bring about peace because they, they don't fight anymore. And in this one body, reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So when Jesus died on the cross, any sins against each other, any anger, any barriers, any hostility is now paid for. Okay, so we no longer need to fight, fight and say, I take revenge for anything. No need. No longer any hostility. It's all been paid. Okay? So it's just now a matter of people responding with a new way of thinking. Remember just now? From now on, we regard no one from worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we will do so no, no longer. And that is now all the differences and hostility, we change that will leave you no more revenge and all the fighting and all that and hostility, but we are brought together, reconciled. And Jesus came and preached peace to you, that means the Gentiles far away, and peace to those who are near, that means the Jews. For through him, we both, that means Jews and Gentiles, can now come to God the Father through one Holy Spirit. Okay, so from this picture, we see that Jesus reconciled us to God despite our sin. That is, whatever we contributed to the evil, suffering and pain of our world towards our fellow men and towards planet Earth. It was a good world that God gave mankind. God gave Adam a good world. Right? But we have all gone our own way. So it's not just Adam. All of us have gone our own ways. So we have to take responsibility for ourselves rather than say, ah, those people are sinful, those people are bad. We have to take personal responsibility for our share. Whether we do big share or small share, we still contributed a share all right, of what has caused the world to bondage to decay. Even though we thought what we did was good, lah, huh? actually it still led to bondage to decay for the world and not so good for other people. Now it is our turn, just like Jesus reconciled us to God, it's our turn to work with Jesus to reconcile people to God. And more than just reconciling to God, we also work to reconcile fellow men to each other. So people to people reconciliation. Just like Jesus reconciled Jew and Gentile, in that sense, people to people reconciliation. So now, same. We also need to reconcile people, people. Jesus put all the division and our hostility, just now we said that one, the, destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility here. Okay, so Jesus put all this division, hostility, offense, hurt to an end by dying on the cross. So when we apply Jesus' word of reconciliation, it means that we also go and tear down all the barriers 
so that we can reconcile all men with each other to now heal relationships. Okay, so in a, in a sense, to rephrase it, it's like the damage that was caused, now we are going to heal. And we are healing the human relationships. All barriers and differences may be reconciled when each one adopts the common thinking mindset and purpose of God. Okay, so just now I, I talked about to be of one mind with God. So here we are, to be one mind with God. Barriers and differences may be reconciled when each one adopts a common thinking and mindset and purpose of God. Be one mind with God. And that's when we become a new and different, that's a holy, remember, man or creation in Christ, which we saw here, a new creation, uh, 317 new creation in Christ. New cre in Christ, new creation. So relationship. Okay? So the thinking and the purpose becomes not our own, but God's thinking and God's purpose. So this is very important. Huh? Our thinking becomes no longer own but God's. if we are a new creation in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jesus reconciled us to God and following that, our double mission calls us to train and do things with a renewed life purpose. We are to reconcile with people we know and reconcile fellow men with their own relationships. So in that sense, the mending of relationships in the world now. To reconcile with someone is to mend, to heal and restore the relationship mentally, that's the, the thinking we have towards each other, right? Thinking towards each other. Emotionally, how we feel in the relationship that has not been that pleasant or not been that loving, perhaps, okay? Um, the way we talk to each other sometimes or the way we do things or don't do things, sometimes that is hurt and it's emotional. Spiritual, all right? There may be spiritual damage in our relationship, and sometimes it may be physical, uh, if there has been some physical fighting, things like that, nah? or abuse. Whichever dimensions are relevant. So, mending, healing, restoring. To mend, to heal, to restore. So there is that, the thinking part, the feeling part, the spiritual connection with each other, and the physical part. So whichever dimensions are relevant in, in the relationship. So in our lifetime, we are hurt as we also hurt others. This is a truth that some people have written about when they talk about suffering. And as they talk about suffering, they say God uses hurt people to heal hurt people. Okay? Um, the basic, first of all, is hurt people hurt people. You know as hurt people hurt people? People who are hurt will hurt other people. Okay? So hurt people hurt people they hurt other people. So God uses hurt people. That means all of us. That includes disciples. We also have been hurt. And we also have hurt people. Okay? So God uses all of us to heal hurt people. And this is where the God wants, God needs again. Okay? Where we have been instruments of hurt and pain 
instruments of suffering, now we become instruments of healing. And that is all part of God's love, and that's all part of spiritual warfare. Not to carry on that human tendency to do all these things. So healing people have a change of heart, not hurt. Change of heart to love rather than hurt. This healing people can work both ways, huh? in the sense that we are being healed. So we are healing people. And as we are healed, we have a change of heart to love rather than to hurt. Okay, so we can also be healing people. Okay, and that is where the, the whole idea of love comes in rather than hurt. Where there are abuse, hurt, and or differences, disciples need to work on resolving them. Each, especially anyone who has caused misunderstanding and strife. Okay? The people who have caused misunderstanding, strife, division, uh, conflict, etc. need to surrender their own opinions and ways to restore interpersonal relationships, to bring them back to wholesome and godly peace and partnership bonds. Okay? So peace and bonding. Partnership bonds. So we all have a part to play and if we are the people who have contributed to misunderstanding, strife, division, conflict, then we obviously have to surrender our opinions and our ways okay, to men back. Now this is an important part of holy warfare against our human nature that is self-absorbed in our own view of right and good. To become holy, each disciple is to be increasingly of the same mind with God and conform to be of that one mind with each other. Okay, I give a bit of thought here, time to think. We are quite self-absorbed in our own view of good and right. And sometimes we use God's word. We use God's word to support our own view of good and right. May not be consistent with the Bible, but still we use it, which means there's a distortion. Either distortion or misunderstanding. Okay, so to become holy or different, therefore then we have to surrender to the possibility that something is blocking us. Something is blocking us in the way we look at good and right, even though it may be Bible verses. Okay, something may be blocking us. As we are self-absorbed, something may be blocking us. Now, through discipleship, each needs to continually strive to receive holistic healing of mind, emotion, and spirit from our life experiences, okay, and similarly bring healing and wholeness to a world with suffering and pain. Okay, so this is where there may be an indication of what blocks us. Holistic healing of mind, emotion, and spirit maybe even the body, uh, abusive experiences, and so on, okay? Experiences that have not been very wholesome or healthy for us. And these, even though we become Christian, they can continue to be a blockage because they are the, the things that prevent us from being able to see what is good and right because we've gone through, let's say, the abuse or we've gone through the, the hardening of the, those terrible experiences, okay? So we may not realize it, but they are blockages if we do not deal with them. Okay, this is a little bit team, but for those of you who want to spend time reflecting, this may be helpful, huh? 
So we are to expose and overcome any obstacles and barriers that exist in ourselves or exist with others. Okay, that is the block, blockage. Huh? Okay, so session four, what can we learn? Trials and challenges will test our faith and commitment to persevere in spiritual warfare to be holy or different like God. Okay, so our faith is challenged and our commitment to spiritual warfare is similarly challenged. Now, God has a double mission for us, for disciples. Evangelize all people. This is a way to express and imitate God's love to reach out to those who need to be saved. Don't forget, it's about eternity. And if you remember, we look at Second Peter, uh, 1 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. It talks about God being patient because he wants all people to be saved. Okay, so remember that the idea of evangelism and giving time is for people to repent. That is for the, the aspect of those people who need to repent and they, are, they may be scoffers or ignorers of God's word. Yeah, but there's also the other group of people Okay, the other group of people who are the disciples or the followers of Jesus, they are given time. They are given opportunity to reach out those, those people who need to repent. So God, does, God wants everyone to come to salvation. So God gives time for his people to work. God also gives time for the people who need to repent. And his whole purpose is that he wants everyone to come to salvation. And in this process, in this time, okay, the people of God have the time to grow in God's love, to grow in the training and the discipline of having God's mind and God's love and perspective. So that's evangelism, the double mission. First, evangelize. Second, train as disciples in holy spiritual warfare. And that will be done as Jesus commands. Okay, if it's done as Jesus commands, this leads people to be partners with God to reduce evil, suffering, and pain in our world. So for all of us, okay, for all of us who become disciples and the right kind of disciples as Jesus commands, we will be, we will be convicted to be aware of our sin and reduce our contribution of evil, suffering, and pain. You see, so in that sense, God is actually using us to cut down our wrongdoing. And when we get other people into God's kingdom, we teach them to cut down on their wrongdoing, the world will change. You see, so God is very wise in the way he is working. He works in so many ways we may not realize. But this is one of the things that God is doing. Engaging us as partners, reducing our share of suffering and pain. At the same time, healing us, getting us to be healed, and then going out to reduce people's suffering and pain and reducing their, uh, or increasing their healing, their reconciliation, and, their, and decreasing their pain so that it can continue to ripple to other people. So the double mission of God is actually very critical to a world of evil, suffering, and pain. And it prepares us for eternity. So being disciples of Jesus includes training to be of one mind with God and conforming to be of the same mindset with each other. The word conforming means there's a lot of effort on our part. Yeah, to conform means you have to fit into that mold that God prescribes in that sense rather than the mold of the world. So the world has molded us in a certain way according to our human nature. See, we already have our own human nature. And when we relate to the world that we live in, the world continues to reinforce and shape our human nature in a certain way. 
right? So now God is teaching us to conform to his way rather than the human nature and the world's way. Okay, so that is a double hardening there. And so there is a need to conform to a new way of God, a new pattern. So we are to be reconciled with God, be reconciled with men, reconcile others to each other. Then we strive to receive healing and bring healing and wholeness to a world of suffering and pain. So what we are able to receive, we are able to impart. Okay, God continues this chain. And again, we say the, the church or assembly of God's people is as strong as the weakest link. So if we all become strong, we will not be a weak link to pass on ignorance. If we are strong, we know what we are doing and we are doing it, we can pass on this knowledge and the skill. Okay, we can pass on the knowledge and the skill and of course, more and more people will be able to accomplish God's purpose. So God wants our response, prioritize our life to be equipped to evangelize, to be discipled and to disciple others in holy spiritual warfare. So one question you can think about is, how long are we to be discipled and disciple other people? Okay, you may ask me that question. I ask you back the question. Think about it. We could, we could, um, we could discuss this because I timed this to finish earlier with a few more minutes to spare. Okay, so we can discuss this. How long? Now, be sensitive to sin. God wants our response. Be sensitive to sin. To repent and get right with God. Get right with others. Reconcile fellow men with each other. Continually seek healing in personal areas from life experiences and relationships and do the same to bring healing to others. All right, so God is putting us here on earth with a lot of objectives. Okay, and these objectives are accomplished when we are very purposeful about what we are doing on earth as people, as disciples of, of God. Okay, so our life here on earth, you can see there's a lot to accomplish. That's why God says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so we need to be very mindful that our own life is short in its mortality. Other people's lives are short too. So we have to use the time in, in these important ways. So let's work out and act on the resiliences. Have you worked on the Isaiah 26 3 for your mental health and resilience? Do you have you tried to memorize it again for the second week? Next week I will introduce a new one which is longer. Okay, but that one you it will be up to you to work on it beyond COVID-19. Okay, but this one. Shall we read it together? Or if you have memorized, recite it meaningfully to yourself. Huh? Isaiah 26 verse 3. You will keep, keep in, in perfect, perfect peace, peace him whose mind is steadfast. Is steadfast. Because, because he, he trusts trust in you. you. Uh, that's God. The you is God. Okay, so how has this verse benefited you? You can share with your friend or with your group. If it has not benefited, consider why to understand your mental situation. What are you struggling with mentally or emotionally that this verse has not benefited you? And what have you been keeping your mind focused on thus far? We are into more than one month of stay home already. Okay, and how's your mental health and resilience? Still strong? Okay, you can talk about that. Then there's the emotional health and resilience. What have your emotions been like as this stay-home period continues? Like I said just now, the beginning, all right, for some families and homes, it has come to violence. Yeah, it has come to violence. It has come to frustration. People are getting hurt at home. The, the safe place that is supposed to be safe has become a place of 
harm and damage. So what have your emotions been like as this homestay period continues? Frustration? Have you been venting out your frustration and things like that? Okay, what's your emotional health and resilience state like? Are there changes that have taken place in your emotions that you brought to God last week or since COVID started or stay home started? Circuit breaker. Continue to focus on the calm and peace that God can put in your heart. Okay, so monitor your own emotional uh, situation. Spiritual health and resilience, what have you learned that affirms faith, God loves and cares for you in times of stress and anxiety? Have you responded? Have you been mindful of God's love and care for you so that it helps you to deal with your stress and anxiety? And if you have spent time meditating, focusing your thoughts, huh? So for Christian meditation, it's not emptying your mind. It's focusing your thoughts on the things you learned. What has helped to strengthen your faith that God is in control and you can entrust your concerns to Him. And in the week between now and the next session five, continue, or if you have not started, then start to make time in your personal schedule to be still, spend time alone with God in silence. Then consider what you can work on to obey God, despite any thoughts or voices of doubt. Okay, what think about how you can obey God on the double mission in God's in today's session. Start planning, thinking, so that when it's all over, you can get out of home, you can go and do something uh, very purposeful on your double mission. And continue to memorize, internalize Isaiah 26, 3 if you can. Uh, next week, I will introduce another one. It will be a longer one, okay? But um, if you can memorize it, it will also reinforce a message about God. Physical health and resilience. Give thanks. Be thankful. Have you been thankful? First Thessalonians 5, uh, I should think 6 to 18 rather. Okay, be joyful. Pray continually without ceasing and give thanks in all situations. For this is God's will you in Christ Jesus. Okay? In Christ Jesus. So if you are in, stay in that relationship with Christ, this is God's mission for you to always be thankful in situations. Maintain a cheerful spirit to be alert and healthy. So this part is the, the mental and emotional way to be physically healthy and resilient. All right. Uh, besides your exercise and your food and rest, the, the physical part. Okay. Maintaining a cheerful, thankful spirit will also contribute to good health and resilience. Social dimension, if possible, reach out to someone who comes to your mind. Catch up with them. Share something useful, important of what you've been learning. And then pray. What have you learned? Surrender what you struggle with to God. Ask God to help you discover and submit to healing and reconciliation in areas or relationships you may not be conscious, that you may be unconscious of. Okay, remember I said just now about the blockages within ourselves sometimes, why we cannot connect with each other or why we are still in strife, misunderstanding and division sometimes. Okay, there are blockages that we may not be realizing in ourselves, which takes time to understand and discover and pray about other areas you have shared or can identify. Okay, very quickly, you have heard me talk about spiritual warfare throughout and I thought it'd be good because it's dispersed all over. I thought it'd be good to just put a little list. Okay, uh, so this is an, a bit of extra. Fighting spiritual warfare, some major points that we raised, we raised in this lesson. Fighting spiritual warfare makes us God's holy people for a heavenly kingdom of eternity. That was in my very beginning when I talk about it. Okay, so we fight to be a holy people and this will prepare us for the heavenly kingdom of eternity. Then, Spiritual warfare is a training of Jesus' disciples as individuals and also as a whole formation. Okay. The weakest link, 
is where sometimes the whole thing breaks. So the chain of transmission, similarly for every generation, if there are weak links in each in the generation, we may not be able to pass on to the next generation. And fighting spiritual warfare reduces our contribution in inverted commerce, not a good contribution to the world of problems. So when we fight, we will slow down bondage to decay. And the idea of fighting spiritual warfare is we are actually fighting against or resisting our human nature tendency. Okay, and when we do that, we will reduce the suffering, pain and evil as this spiritual warfare teaches us to grow in God's love. And fighting spiritual warfare also reconciles and heals. Doing the opposite, okay, very actively doing the opposite of our human nature. Yes, our human nature is capable of good and greatness, goodness and greatness, but still continues to, uh, to estrange and hurt people. Okay, although it does also do reconciliation and healing for those who are good and great, but not in God's perspective of eternity. So our perspective of spiritual warfare is really go deeper to reconcile and heal spiritually as well as towards human relationships. Okay, so we finished with a little bit of time to spare and this is where we can discuss. All right. Um, any thoughts or you want to come back to that point, that question I asked you? What was the question? Anybody has a thought, a response? We have about 10 minutes, so that's good for questions and discussion. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and take some time to think and process. I realize I cover really a lot non-stop. Yes, yes. Can you speak louder? Uh, one way to speak louder is go to your speaker, the, vo the volume, uh, turn it to maybe 100%. Oh, um, towards the end when you're talking about something like footprint, like footprint, footprint change, yeah, all that, then I mean, I was just thinking, yeah, you know, when people want to fight, you say global warming, right? We call it the carbon, we lessen our carbon footprint. Carbon footprint. So yeah, like yes. if you want to lessen uh, the devastation, right, of global warming and all that. So the green movement, what they will do, they call it, we want to lessen the carbon footprint. So mm -hmm. for us, right, disciples, it just struck me that we have to reduce our sin footprint in this world. Yes. Yeah, but I ask, Very good. Myself, I ask myself, for these people who said, you know, the green movement, they abstain from all the kind of behaviors uh, that actually contribute to it. Then I ask myself, why is it we cannot stop all our behaviors uh, so that we lessen our sin footprint? So I realize it's a truly high calling because it deals not with our outward behavior. Like the green movement is like, okay, behind it, there's a belief, right? But it's still dealing with outward behavior, what you do. But for us, right, if we want to reduce the sin footprint, it is actually dealing with our inner nature, our whole nature, which is why it's so hard. And which you keep saying, right, we have to like change the behavior and blah, 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 and all that, our innate nature. So I do agree with you. 
So that's just my observation. So I coined that for me. I want to reduce my sin footprint in the world. I think that's a very, very good way of putting it. Instead of carbon put, footprint, we now talk about sin footprint. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. And then earlier on, you were talking about ripple effect about things and then, you know, like a spiritual baby, we grow and all that. So I also have this thought, right? Ripple effect, right? If you really look at ripple effect, it always starts with something very small. Like if yes. you travel on the lake, you know, you start the ripple effect. So I always think, why do people want to do big things? They go mission trip overseas, they do this, they do that. But when you deal with them, sometimes you can't even feel like so they even care about you or even show any consideration for you. So, so it's like, oh, okay, what ripple effect is that? And then we talk about like, okay, uh, you know, you bring a new believer to Christ, then they are spiritual babies. So again, I look at it, you know, in our human world, we, if we are mothers, we have brought up a baby before, spiritual, a real baby. And what, we, what do we do? We shower all the care and all the love and everything, right? Tender love to bring them up, right? Because if we don't, right, if we let any of this, uh, it becomes uh, abusive and there are so many children now under foster care in the institution because the parents do not know how to bring them up. So I'm just like thinking, you know, yeah, so okay, we want to bring out a spiritual baby. It's not a big thing that we do, like we know the Bible so well or we, we do mission work or we serve a lot in the church. But it's just like basically simply that you make them feel loved. You just love them like a baby, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, then, then that's how I think you can get the dynamic effect that you're talking about. So all of us can start very small, right? And then we will have a dynamic effect in the church. I don't know, it's just what my... You know, no, you bring excellent points to the table, Georgina. This is, this is where you see, okay, you, you talk about people who, who go far out as missionaries, but then they come back, don't, they talk as if they don't seem to care about us and stuff like that. Uh, don't know how fair that would be to say everybody, lah. Okay, let's be. No, no, I'm not saying it's just an example. But, I bring it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to support your point in the sense that this is where um, you, you remember I said that um, our purpose is to do all these things, but because we are a weak link somewhere in the chain, I think the teaching has not come down to us properly. As, as it has included, teaching has not come to the missionaries properly, so much so that when they, when they, uh, when they do things, they, they forget the whole concept of love for, for people as well, maybe people back home, whatever their case may be, that could be the, the, the weak link of transmitting teaching that was not properly or completely done so that we all understand these things to very intentionally work at them. And I think you say it so beautifully when you say that physical babies, we love pamper and we really take fantastic care of them, but maybe spiritual babies, we don't. Probably the reason is spiritual babies are not those that we carry in our arms like that and then, you know, like feed you milk bottle, that kind of thing and bring you to the toilet potty and do your, your business there. We, we spiritual Parenting, we cannot do that kind of thing. We can't literally bring you to the toilet, strip you and then tell you to, okay, poo or pee there. That kind of thing. But actually, we still need to do our version of teaching them how to toilet train, poo and pee and all that. Yeah, so you, you made a very good point there. All the points you said are very good. These are things that we all really need to think about more. Basically, yes. Okay, we have five more minutes. Anybody else has a, has a reflection that's coming to you to share? To help us see the picture better? Okay, so we shall not belabor, belabor the point, right? Um, but let's think about what would God want us to do, okay? 
think about what would God, what would God want us to do. You realize from session one to now session four, I've been trying to build up a picture, right? And as it, as it builds up progressively, you see how the emphasis is, God has always been talking to all people through crisis, through life situations that we face, God is talking to all people. And especially now, the last next, last two sessions, fifth lesson, sessions five and six, I'll be talking about the bigger group of the church. This session has been the individual because it's for us to focus on ourselves. Because like I said, the chain is as strong as the weakest link. So we have to focus on ourselves as the individual links now. And then next week, we'll talk about the whole chain, the whole church. Okay? And then session six, we will, we will um, integrate, try to integrate and see where the whole thing is leading us to. What is the conclusion that God wants us to be able to discover? Um, Alfred, I got one more question now. Huh? Yes, so sure. Once and need workers, right? And then you said you talk about the difference between that and you'll cover it later. Did I miss it? Or what wants and needs? Yeah, then you, you mentioned like, oh, you will share like what's the difference between a want and a need? Yes, God wants us to work because the need is for us to change. Ah, uh, okay, sorry. I grow. guess I missed that. Yeah, okay. The need is for us more than for God. God doesn't need, God is powerful enough to do everything himself by, by his power. But then it will not Thank accomplish you. the thing in us. Uh, good, you ask so that I can clarify. God doesn't need us if you talk about ability and power. But he needs us because it's for us to learn, it's for us to grow, and it's for us to learn to love and care. Okay, so it is our need. God is thinking of. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we shall close. Right, uh, the rain is coming in <laughs> on my side. Let's pray and, and uh, finish off for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, God, for this opportunity once again that you enable us to be together so that we are able to learn your word as a body of Christ and learn, Lord, the kind of response that will be good and that will be healthy because we are serving our needs as well as the needs of the world that we are in. And we pray, Father, Lord, that you will find us faithful as we move forward with what we are tasked to do in our missions. We thank you and give you praise for all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.